Hello everyone, I'm Dalton Burdett. And I'm Nick Iricchio. No, you're not. And I'm Vittoria Rosati. And we are the Movie Knights. Well, some of them. Well, some of them. And if you're watching this because you want to hear our uncensored... Unfiltered... Thoughts and opinions on the world of movies and entertainment news, so kick back... Relax. And thank you for being part <laughs> of the conversation. You nailed it. <laughs> you nailed it. And guys, um... So last week on the show, we mentioned that we were going to be taking a break for Thanksgiving, but we did land a little special video just for you guys. We had the honor and privilege of interviewing Mr. John D. Nicola, who is a very famous songwriter and artist now. He uh, recently released uh, two albums that you can find on Apple, Spotify, all those good things. We're going to leave links to those in the description below so you can go right there and watch them. But infamously, being the movie crowd that you are, he is one of the people responsible for writing the songs the Time of My Life, and Hungry Eyes from the all-time classic Dirty Dancing. And so we got to interview him, and he is a lovely person, and he was an amazing guy to interview. Please have a great time with our interview with Mr. John DiNicola. See you later. So first off, uh, Mr. DiNicola, thank you so much for joining us. How are you doing today? I'm good. How about you? Doing well, doing well. Thank you. So I wanted to dive right in here. Um, you know, we are uh, mostly a movie-related show, and so I want to talk right away about the amazing cinematic music video for um, your most recent single. And um, I, I really, really enjoyed watching it. It almost had, like, Kubrick-style zooms. It had, like, a, a very um, almost 80s throwback feel to it, and it fit the song beautifully. And I was wondering for that music video, um, one, uh, why that particular song for the video? And two, uh, did you have any cinematic influences when pitching that video to people to make? You know, um, Anima Works is the company that did it, um, who happened to be my son, Jake, and his partner, Hill Stedman. And um, they came to me, you know, they knew the record. Uh, and she said is the title track of the album. So, um, you know, they had an idea and um, they also had a 16 millimeter, have a 16 millimeter camera. So we did that on film and of course transferred digitally, but that's why it sort of has that look. Um, um, but, uh, you know, we chose that song because uh, it's the first song on the record. Um, you know, uh, it is a combination of what you just said, kind, kind of this, I, I, you know, um, I, coming from, um, <laughs> the seventies influence, I, it was, it was interesting to me that such a seventies, um, influence came out in, uh, I did another record, uh, I'm sounding confused, but I did a record two years before this record, and it was of all songs that I have written for other artists, you know, including the songs from the Dirty Dancing soundtrack. And then this latest record was written during the pandemic, and it was all new songs that for the first time in my life, I wrote for me as an artist. So it was a completely different process completely different type of music and what did come out was a lot of 70s uh, soul influence um and, and i tried to meld it with and i hopefully i did because i do i do find some you know 20 year, mid 20 year olds liking this record i was hoping to marry it with sort of the indie pop that's happening these days um you know, like a Tame Impala or an Alex G or so. I was hoping to bridge that um, after all these years of being a songwriter, being a bass player, being a musician, and then all of a sudden being an artist. Um, kind of fun. What compelled you to write for yourself for the first time in, in so many years? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, the uh, I can't really answer that. You know, the first record, um, the first record came about because I had just put a um, recording studio in my barn. I, I don't know if you can see out there, but there's a big 
barn room and um i started to i i just started recording drums just to see how the room sounded and and um i i quickly decided well let's i had my son lay down drums for this song that i um wrote that was in a Sylvester Stallone movie called Avenging Angelo. I co-wrote it with Frankie Previtt, who I also co-wrote the Dirty Dancing songs with. And um, the song was in the movie um, <laughs> sung by Steve Holy, but it was never released as a single, as a song. So I um, I, I felt I wanted to re-record that with the way I heard it in my head and in hopes of getting someone else to cover it. Um, and when it came time to put a vocal on it, uh, I just said, well, let me throw my vocal down on it. And I did, and people responded well to it. So that snowballed into me finding songs from uh, my catalog of songs that I plugged or songs that were covered, a John Wade song, or, as I said, the Dirty Dancing songs. And, um, you know, I had fun. I had fun because it was um, for the first time I didn't have I didn't put like what would this person this artist want to do what kind of a song would they want to do you know a lot of times as a songwriter you get a a pitch right it, it goes out to all the songwriters uh, you know um, this one uh, Celine Dion's looking for a song that's going to be like this so you're always years of being in other people's heads uh it was liberating um to be able to just do me and and actually in a way revealed to me who i am as an artist i've always been sort of a, um you know back up or songwriting for others and and then the second record um just the challenge i think of of writing songs for this new artist <laughs> that I found uh, in myself. So, um, and again, I, I I immediately pulled out my Juno, uh, uh, Roland Juno 106, which is an old keyboard. It's an old synth, um, but people like Kevin Parker uh, and uh, others in, in modern bands, you still use this keyboard. And it just so happens that I wrote Hungry Eyes back in the day on this keyboard. It's a, it's an unmistakable sort of sound um, to that. So I don't know if I answered the question. I think it was a challenge. Um, I had so much fun on the first record, uh, you know, because I, I get to mess with all this gear. I, I have, you know, I, in the other room, I have pianos and organs and it's just i'm i'm a a kid in a in a in a man cave i think and um just fun fun and um uh i think i got a pretty good response on the first record so i i guess i wanted more of that yeah no um both albums are phenomenal and speaking of hungry eyes um you that is one of the songs where you actually re-recorded as your own artist and with and I know that you just spoke of the challenges of doing a song for another artist versus doing a song for yourself and using a song that's so tied to your past, like Hungry Eyes, and making that for yourself. Was there any particular set of challenges or a mindset through emotion? Because, you know, creating art, whether it be music or movies, the main thing that drives it is the feeling and the emotion. You know, what what were you feeling when you had to do that song again, but in a more personal manner for you? Yeah, well... As I was going through these songs for the first record, it's called the Why Because it's behind me there, the one on the that one there. Um, uh, as I was going through songs, I, I, I said, "Well, I I guess I have to do Hungry Eyes because why not?" I mean, I, um, although you know, the back of my head, I'm thinking it's a, a song so many people know. Um, so how can I do it? And, and again, I, I'm going to put it on my son Jake. Um, I said, Jake, how, how I'm, I'm a little afraid of doing this song. <laughs> how do you think I should approach it? And he said, well, there's a lot of, again, indie, um, modern rock in indie rock bands that, um, sort of 
touch on um, 80s synth pop, you know, making music today with that. And so he said, uh, I, I, you know, I think that's how you should approach it. And actually, he's playing drums on that, which was, um, uh, you know, we started jamming it out. And, and his feel for it certainly brought it, I think, into the, you know, 2020 era. And um, um, I used the same keyboard, though. It's that same keyboard. I did mess with the chord changes a little bit. I changed the melody a little bit. Um, I, I, I'm a kind of a gut player or, you know, singer or whatever. I, it's whatever, it's, um, whatever just comes out is what I go with. I, you know, I don't try to, you know, do anything other than what, you know, it, it, it in that way, it's, um, you know, it feels real natural to me, um, I, I always explain it that, you know, you, you take in all this music your whole life, uh, you know, as a musician or even as a non-musician, but as a musician, you take all this music in for years and years and years, and then you sort of regurgitate it out in a way, and um, it becomes kind of a subconscious um on a subconscious level, as stuff just comes out. Hungry Eyes, the original version, I wrote musically in like ten minutes. It just poured out, and and I I feel it's um, you know, it's just like a portal of 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 a stream of consciousness, and it and it just comes through. Sometimes, sometimes you have to work hard. You get a seed of an idea, and um, you have to work really hard to make the song what you think it should be and other times it just flows out and I, i've talked to some other writers and you know they say the same thing sometimes it's uh it's just an easy path as someone who's seen music evolve in so many different ways and you've seen so many bands be creative and then fall apart and then new bands and the new thing and the new people I guess I'm wondering, is it, you just said that it's, it's very natural that you just kind of put out what you put out, but what, if it's, if you're aware of it, or if it's just something that comes natural, what makes your music continue having that 70s and 80s feeling to it? Is that on purpose? Is that your favorite era? It, it, again, I, I didn't expect it. There was two or three songs on that record, four songs on that record, maybe maybe more than that I, you would probably know better than i but to me uh it just uh came out I, I don't know as a singer you know i did spend a lot of time uh when i was kind of singing but it was always back up but I, you know we in my early early years the first um you know years out of high school and college uh actually between high school and college uh, I was in a cover band and we did, you know, at the time it was that kind of music, you know, it was Barry White and the stylistics. And so that uh, was imprinted on me pretty good. Uh, as I said, I, I feel like I hope that it's, um, you know, it spans the eras in that way. I, I feel like musically, sonically, it, it's more modern, but the melodies that came out were kind of... Uh, almost Philly's soul. And I, I, I never spent any time in Philadelphia. So I don't, <laughs> I don't know why. You'd mentioned before that there was a, you know, there's, there was a big gap in the time that you were kind of creating songs for other people versus for yourself as an artist. And in that time, you know, before you put out your first record a few years ago, were there ever any false starts where you were thinking about it and about to do it? And then for whatever reason, took a step back or were there ever, or was it not even on your mind until a few years ago? Like, you know, what through all that time, you know, what was kind of going through your head as an artist as to what your next step could be? Yeah, it was ne no, it never, never occurred to me to be an artist um, on my own. I mean, I, I obviously worked in original bands as a bass player and a backup singer, but I never, uh, I kind of wish I had done it sooner, honestly, but it never crossed my mind. I, I don't know. I can't tell you why it did now, but uh, 
it, it is it, it's been kind of addictive for me it's it's uh although i haven't done the i haven't started a third record so i don't know maybe i'll slow down here but it never occurred to me to be an artist right and um you know i i have a little bit of uh i i you know, a little bit of stage fright in a way. I guess a lot of artists do, but uh, I, I didn't as somebody's bass player, although I, you know, you get a little nervous when you go up there, but when you're the f singing your songs up front, you know, I, I, I haven't done that many shows because uh, COVID hit when my records came out, but, but um, you know, it's a little, it's a little daunting. It's a, it's a lot of pressure. And I don't know, maybe that's why I never did it. I, I, I can't answer why I'm doing it now. And, but I can say that I, I never really thought about doing it. And I'm sorry, because I'm loving it. <laughs> I really am loving it. That's something that I was wondering, because I was trying to figure out if you did any live performances, um, because at, back in, the, it, in Brazil, which is where I'm from, back in the day, they used to always release um, one, like the studio album and then a live version of everything so i was looking for that because of the feel of your music i was like oh it'd be really interesting if you had that so i was looking for that and i was like oh i can't not only is there no album but also i can't find any information on live performances do, do you want to do it yeah i do i i i'm thinking about it now uh you know, it's a big undertaking for a, a full band. I, I'm probably going to start um, with a, a, maybe a two piece, which I, I've done a couple of times. But I would, I do want to, I, I want to present my last record with the same band I did. Was there no bitter end? Um, I did a show for the first record, a record release party at the bitter end, and, and it should be on YouTube. Some of it should be on YouTube at least. I guess it didn't show up. Maybe I never, maybe it was never posted. I think some was posted. I looked for it on um, like Spotify, Apple Music. I didn't, I should have looked at YouTube. I think there's uh, some, some of it from the bitter end. I, I don't even know who put it up. It wasn't me, but somebody, uh, I, you know, now that you say that, I, I'm, I'm going to try and put some up because, because we had, it was a good show. We had, we had fun. I would recorded it. Uh, I should put some of it up. Please, please put some of it up. I, I, I would love to see that. And, you know, especially like as she was saying, you know, the whole feel and vibe of your records are like are kind of born for live performances, you know. And, and I also think that a lot of music is born for live performances. But, you know, there's something really special in the feel of your songs. And, you know, going going to that, you know, um, I would love to learn more about you. Like I purposely didn't do research into, you know, you growing up and to you going to school because I wanted to hear it from you. You know, tell us about your beginnings and tell us how you got involved into this industry and what kind of what, you know, one inspired you to kind of come in and start doing this. Um, you know, from a very early age, um I wanted to do music. I I I I can remember as a 8-year-old in my basement strumming my brother's guitar i didn't you know i didn't know what, what to do with this hand i just was picking and my i heard my mother from upstairs who by the way was a kind of an ear piano player she was an artist a painting artist and but she played piano by ear but she i heard her talking to my dad saying he sounds like he'd be good on guitar so i you know i i think that you know hit me but i i always um I can remember hearing music on the radio and saying, you know, I think it was part of the time. I mean, think about it. I, I was 12 in 1967. So you got Jimi Hendrix, um, you know, Traffic, Steve Winwood. You have, you know, of course, the Beatles, um, the Rolling Stones. I mean, kind of in the heyday, maybe, uh, maybe, maybe early 70s uh, for me it's the heyday is like 67 to 72 maybe so um um you know I, that's where i i i started i my mom took me my cousin had a one stop if you know what a one stop is it's where all the local stores get distributed you know 
go to this one-stop distribution to get their albums. This is back in the day of vinyl. And uh, my um, my mother said, well, I went to, to, to my to my cousin's place who who was a one-stop supplier. And she said, pick out three albums. And I picked out uh, Dear Mr. Fantasy, Traffic. I picked out a band called Moby Grape. And I picked out Jimi Hendrix, All Your Experience, which were just released. So I'm giving my age away. Um, and, um, you know, I just got drawn in. And I, I met some uh, uh, friends of mine in seventh grade. And they were also had, were bitten by the bug. And they had some cool amps, some cool guitars. And and uh, I just, you know, we we formed a band. And and then in, in high school, in high school, I kind of veered. I got into... Um, more like Frank Zappa and like Weather Report and fusion stuff and a jazz fusion music and um but I was in a in, in that band I mentioned where we we covered a lot of uh you know R&B and and then we then we switched to a, a to being a rock band then I went back to Berkeley College of Music to study more uh, more of that and after that I got called uh, by this band Flight that had a record deal on Motown. It was a jazz fusion band. And uh, curiously enough, many years later, Erica Badu sampled our our song from that record for um, Back in the Day, which was a big hit for her. Um, and then um, that morphed, uh, you know, into getting, I got back into pop music and that uh, I started to, play in bands uh that were trying to get record deals instead of you know just making a living um we were you know and so once you're in a band like that you need to write songs and that's what brought me to writing songs and um i just uh i, I don't think i ever had a doubt my you know since i was a little kid that i wanted to play music that I'm still able to do it and make a living at it is a uh, kind of a blessing. I, I feel really, really lucky uh, about that, but it's something I always wanted to do. I, I um, surround myself with instruments and I come out here and I uh, dig around and I, I play and it's uh, probably nothing more satisfying for me than putting a track down building a track and writing a song and having it come from nothing right blank sheet of paper to a finished product I, you know um sometimes uh sometimes i go well you know really at the end of the day what is it three minutes of of music that doesn't necessarily matter to anyone you know so i'm, I'm not I'm not curing any diseases, but um, it feels good. It's a it's a soul um, soothing thing that I do. Um, well, okay. Hearing now that you took a while to start writing, um, how was that tough for you to when you started writing? Was that you know a challenge? Or was it as natural as it is now? No, um, I'm. I usually work with a lyricist. If I I'm on the music side of things, I'm melody oh. and music and building instrumental tracks, and uh, I I usually will send a, a music track to someone I'm working with lyric lyrically, and I'll be humming a melody, and sometimes some words will come out, and that will sort of dictate a chorus or something like that. But um, I'm, I've been uh, mostly work with lyricists. So, um, and let's see, how old was I when I started actually writing? I mean, I was writing in flight. So that was, you know, I was, oh, God, I guess I was, you know, 25, 30 before I started writing. And, um, you know, writing, I was a musician all those years, but uh, when, you know, to really start writing. And then um, I started, I, 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 I had a musical track out there that I was, I was recording at my friend David Prater's recording studio. And, and um, 
there was a gentleman also working with David, you know, not with me, but on other days. And his name was Frankie Previtt, who I co-wrote the Dirty Dancing songs with. And he was he was in a band called Frankie and the Knockouts that lost their record deal. And so he was trying to write songs for a new record deal. So I, um, David played him this music track. Um, and Frankie said, oh, I would love to write to that. And that was Hungry Eyes. Our first song that we wrote together was Hungry Eyes. And during, we then we wrote a bunch more songs for Frankie and the Knockouts. That, Hungry Eyes was originally for Frankie and the Knockout. And, and then during that time, Jimmy Einer, who was the musical director for the movie Dirty Dancing, contacted Frankie, who, who Frankie used to be on his record label. Um, and he said, I, I, we have this movie that uh, we need a song for. And, you know, a lot of people have been submitting songs and they're getting ready to film the movie, but they don't have the song. They're still using a Lionel Richie temp track, which, you know, they were all, you know, you know they needed a song, they needed an original song. And um, so Frankie um, told me about that. And so uh, I started working with a guy named Don Markowitz and we came up with the music that ended up being, uh, I've had the time of my life. Um, so then I was, with those those kind of songs, you know, um, you know, which took a while to get to where they are today. I mean, but you know, they were hit songs. I mean, uh, you know, "Time of My Life" was number one, and "Hungry Eyes" was number four. So you get thrown in to that writer's bin, right? Um, so you know, but it's. Um, you know, it's it's a it's an odd thing to to um, to be you know kind of focused on as a, as a songwriter. I, I wasn't used to that, you know. So uh, I, I ended up, you know, I worked with John Wade, I worked with Eddie Money, and, and I worked with different people. But um, you know, it was, it was the plugging songs is not a fun thing, you know. It's you know, I, my personality isn't like, here, you got to do my song and listen to this song. It's a huge hit for you. You got to do, it. that's not me. So, I mean, you know, I, 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 I got my share of covers after those two big songs. Of course, it's hard to match that success, but um, <clears throat> I think that's why uh, being an artist has, has been so much of a pleasure for me because it's the the that weight that sort of pressure isn't on you anymore and it's you know it's it's whatever's inside and and you do whatever it takes you you don't have to worry about pleasing somebody else you know you're just pleasing yourself in a way i mean and hoping that pleases others you know of course the bottom line is you want others to like you know to like what they hear so you know so i guess in in a way you're 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 doing what you do in hopes that others will enjoy it how has that been different for you you're saying you know you you take what's inside and you put it out there you worked with you know in collaboration with with bands and you were in bands for so long and then finally going solo, sure, you, you know, you worked with people, you say you worked with your son, but how different was that where you had so many people's insides to worry about and then you're like, you know what, this is my inside and this is what we're doing. It's liberating. It's It was fun. It's, it's a, almost, it's a little addictive. I, I didn't expect to like it as much as I did. You know, as I said, the first record were songs that I'd already written for other people. Uh, whether they got covered or not, you know. Um, so the second one, I, and I love the first record, and I love those songs, but the second one, um, I, I like I said earlier, it, it's to um, to just get in here and start playing stuff, you know, playing a chord pattern on on the keyboard, and then 
putting a guitar part on that and the bass part and then coming up with a melody um it's just it's just a lot of fun it's a lot of fun i i i uh i love playing all different instruments i, I you know i'm i'm a sort of a what do they call that jack of all trades master of none i'm a, i'm a pretty good bass player but everything else i functionally you know i, I think <laughs> For my stuff, it's been years of of making tracks for other people, and I think that helped me now uh, to be able to do it for myself. Uh, you know, um, by uh, you, you, as songwriting sort of evolved from you know a guitar and a vocal or a piano and a vocal to now it's like you, you've got to have the track finished you know it's it's a it's a production uh now it's you know the days of a, a little melody and a, you know uh writing a song and a, 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 on a piano and and then somebody you know orchestrating it those days are over it's now it's um you know it's it's loops and samples and and um you know, uh, melodies that repeat. And uh, so, um, you know, it, it, um, this is this is just so much. I'm still doing it old school in a way, you know. Um, I, I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned that you liked what you heard because uh, it is kind of old school. Um, hopefully, like I said, meets some new school, you know, sonically. Yeah, and, uh, you know, I, th I think the, a huge important thing to say is in any art form medium, passion always bleeds through. And I think part of the reason why, at least to me personally, you know, listening to your records, why I resonated with them and why I found them, you know, very well done. And I was enjoying them, not only because obviously I like the sound, but you can tell it bleeds through. The person making them really wanted to make it and you can feel that. And I think... Like I said, every medium, whether it be movies, songs, you know, if you're watching a movie, you can tell if the person who made the movie didn't want to make the movie. Like you can watch it and you can just, you feel it. And, you know, with your albums, with your records, you know, you could feel how much fun you were having being even on the listening side of it. And I think that's, that's why it was so much fun to dive into and listen to. And I'm sure for you as well as creating. Um, yeah, and something else I wanted to bring up is, you know, you'd mentioned that you, you know, knew from when you were a kid that you really wanted to be in music. Um, the uh, music bug has been passed on to your son. Uh, how early did he kind of start showing traits of wanting to be into music? And is that like a familial, uh, like, is that, does that continuing? He's a drum, a very good drummer. He has a great band uh, named Fovea, F-O-V-E-A, um, who put out a couple of records. Uh, actually, I produced them in, in the studio um but he is more on film he's his his career is is film um as i said he did that video um he's uh he's actually we're working on a documentary on uh the musician peter lewis who was a founding member of moby grape um and uh, i'm actually working on his second record uh peter um but um so he you know he, he's musically inclined he's also boy he's a musicologist i mean he listens to every kind of music and um you know he, he if you look at his playlist i mean it's all over the place but uh he's a really inventive drummer he's he's uh he has a different um different you know different than a lot of drummers you know he's much more melodic with his drums than you know pop music is kind of you know kick snare kick snare he's very um very inventive you know changing rhythms and times and a lot of toms and stuff but but uh you know he's his his heart is in film and he works he's a he's an independent um you know, freelancer, but God, he, he works harder than anybody I've ever seen. He's just always working, which is a good thing. He's, he's in New York city. 
Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, you know, being in, you know, indie film, indie freelance, you know, if you don't, I, I've, you know, on our personal level and, you know, just collaborator, collaborators and people we know, the constant work, it's it's not, it's not news, you know, it's it's something that you see and you deal with and it's, it, it can be rough sometimes, especially, especially when right as you're on the cusp of finishing a project, you get like six offers of like, what do you want to do next? And you're just like, God, I just want to go to bed. <laughs> Like, right. honestly, so that, that's what you guys do. Um, mm-hmm. He, uh, you know, I, I, as a somebody in the recording world, you know, there's long 12 hour, you know, studio, you're in the studio for an hour, you know, it takes a long time to get stuff down. So there's a lot of time spent. But that said, I take my hat off to you guys. I mean, I'm, you know, you guys are long, long hours and lugging gear. And I mean, we lug gear too. We lug dams, but in the recording world, you don't have to lug much, but you know, as a, as a, as a band, you just have to lug gear, but, but um, yeah, I, you, you guys are round the clockers. I mean, it's all hours of the day or night and uh, my hat's off to you guys. I have a question about that um so in film there's something you've definitely heard of it at this point but it's the hurry up and wait how much or how true is that in in music do you have a version of that how does that happen yeah i think it's the same thing you know yeah we need this we need this right away and we need it right away and then it's like then it sits for months or you know maybe it never (laughs) even materializes but that happens all the time yeah hurry up and wait is a is something you know we we say a lot in in this business yeah and uh, i know we briefly talked about uh dirty dancing and i do want to go back to it because of course if i didn't ask about it the audience would have my head and also it's um it's something that is also fun on a personal level for me because dirty dancing is my mother's all-time favorite movie like when she grew up she only saw two movies in the movie theater and dirty dancing was one of them So it has like a profound memory for her. And, um, you know, the song Time of My Life specifically, um, whenever it plays, whenever it's on the radio, whenever the first notes begin, if my mother's in the room, you have to stop whatever you had planned the next few minutes because the the song's getting cranked. She's belting it out at the top of her lungs. And it always it always brings her immense joy. So I I know you made you made an off comment earlier of just kind of like, you know, oh, like, you know, I know I'm not saving lives, but I like making art. I think it's fun. The amount of joy that you bring people through your work, it's it it does play a role. And and I know that like as an artist, even on my end, like sometimes you you look at the work you're doing, like whether for us, it's film for you, it's music. And you look at it and you kind of look at the problems on the outside world. And you're like, "Is, is what I'm doing like, is that? is this okay? Like, should I be doing things to like, or should I be doing other more important things? And I I find that there's always, you know, and when it comes to entertainment, when it comes to art, there's always going to be room in people's hearts and people's lives for it. So, you know, just even on a personal level for my, for my mother, thank (laughs) you for the amount of joy that, you know, you've been able to bring to her. And, you know, it's just, it's an amazing thing to see. Well, I appreciate that. I, I appreciate your mom. Um, it is, you know, it, it, at times it gets overwhelming to know. I mean, that song it, and Hungry Eyes, but not as much uh, as the time of my life. It's known the world over. So to be a part of, of a song that is uh, at this point a classic, um, I think it's number 15 on the ASCAP all time played songs ever. Uh, and, you know, you can, you can go wherever in the world and people know the song. So that I, you know, I feel great about that. Um, you know, I, 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 it's just every once in a while I, I question, but, but I do know that, um, you know, in times of turmoil, um, I think people look to music for some uh, answers and some respite. You know, so uh, it's, it's, it's. Um, I say it sometimes, but I probably, I guess I don't really mean it. I, I think it's, uh, every once in a while it feels frivolous, <laughs> but, you know, at, at, you know, in times like this where you say your mom, you know, enjoys it and uh, you can't ask for, to have uh, uh, um, anything more than this kind of imprint on, on people. So, 
And I have to say, you guys really ask some great questions. I'm, I'm done a lot of interviews and um, it's always kind of <laughs> the same thing. This is different. And, you know, I, I hope I gave you good answers, but because it was like all like a uh, little, little skewed questions, which uh, I enjoy. No, hey, that, that's the highest compliment you could give us <laughs> as people who ask questions. So th thank you for that. Yeah. Um, uh, all right, hold on. Let's see what else I got because that now that threw me off. Let me. <laughs> no, hold on, hold on, hold on. All right, you got one. Okay, um, okay. I just had. It's just you brought up your mom. If I don't bring up my mom, she's gonna kill me when I get home. Um, she had a meeting tonight. Um, when I told her that we were interviewing you, she was beside herself. I was like, she was like, oh, can I come? Like, please, like, I just want to say hi. Like, I was like, mom, I, I don't know. Um, probably not, but. I just, oh, oh my God. She dropped me off here and she was so deeply upset that she wasn't going to be able to come in and say hello. hello. Also, she grew up as a dancer. She was a dancer for many, many years um, until she was an adult. And then she became a dentist, which is left turn. But anyway, um, she, so it was so inspiring to her. It's still, it's one of her favorite movies. And she, I mean, she just loves it and she played the piano for many years and she played however many other instruments i don't even keep up with it anymore no it's interesting that you know she had all, all that uh, on the art artist side of her and then to pull on the other part of the brain and 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 work on dentistry so it's, it's interesting i think what you see a lot more back then than you do now is uh, um Oh, and this is actually now I wonder how supportive your parents were of you when you decided to become a musician, because to her, that's what happened. Her parents grew up very, very poor in Brazil and they were both dentists and they were like, nope, like no shot. You're not dancing as a living. Yeah. You know, uh, my parents were really supportive. Uh, they were, um, you know, uh, my mom was a housewife and my dad was a, a bricklayer, um, first generation here their their parents were um italian um that came here in like 1910 1915 and um you know they were always very supportive you know uh they you know they first got, got me my first lessons and uh you know there there was a lot of art going around i mean there were you know they weren't art artists but there was a lot of art being made in the household uh you know my dad uh you know would not that it's art but he would he would c cook and uh um and and he would uh, do like woodworking stuff and my mom would upholster uh reupholster a sofa she would she had a bunch of paintings that she did that, that were kind of uh you know, really nice. And then she would sit at the piano. I just thought about it the other day because uh, I'm kind of an ear player. I, I'm not a studied player. I did some studying at Berkeley Music, but she just played piano by ear. So the, there was, um, you know, music in the house and, and, um, and um, you know, it, it was encouraged. They, I never got... I never, they never discouraged me ever. They never said, oh, you can't, you know, you can't make music, you know, a, a living. They never said that. My, like I said, we we used to kind of work with my dad bricklaying and that was pretty good incentive to, uh... <laughs> I did not, you know, in the dead of winter or the 95 degree heat in you know, cement dust. And so um, I knew I wanted to do something else, but, but very, very supportive. That's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, you know, and even even nowadays, like, yes, parents, a lot of parents nowadays are more supportive of things. But, you know, I, I see it, too. Like, I've I can't tell you how many film festivals I've been to where I've seen an exceptional film from a, like a really young person. And then I'm like, you know, what are you doing next? And they're like, probably nothing. And I'm like, what? Like, and it is really it's hurt. It hurts to see because, like, you know, it was I was really moved by it. And I was in a room with maybe like 30 people. And it's like these are the only 30 people who are going to experience what I just did. And it's. You know, it's it sucks to see, but you know, you still you still see some of that now. You know what uh, what your mom had to go through. You know, it's it really is just something. Yeah, I don't know. I think um, 
I don't know what the answer to that is. I, I would think when it's really important to you, you know, uh, if I didn't make music, I'd probably be sick or something. You know what I mean? It's, it's um, it, you know, when it's in your blood, when it's, you got the bug for it, um, nothing's going to stop you. I, I, I'm, um, you know, music is a little harder because the, the money isn't what it was um, because of streaming. You know, it, you, you, I can I can get in a, a quarter, in a three-month period, I can get uh, 8 million streams between all my kick stuff. And, you know, it's like 200, 300 bucks. I mean, that's, you know, you can't live on that. But film, I'm, you know, it surprises me because film seems like there's so many more outlets than there used to be. You know, there, there's a million outlets for film. So you, I would think if somebody makes a, a what, you know, somebody considers a good film, you'd think you'd keep going with it. More yeah. so than music. Music, music is, is just a little harder. You have to, you know, albums end up being a promotion for your shows. You know, you're not making, you know, back in the day, you, you know, you made all your money off, off the LP. And then on top of that was your, your shows. But um, film, it just seems, I, I don't know because I'm not in it, but um, it would seem to me there there's so many outlets between the everything on, on you know, streaming and, you know, every every week there's a new venue for your, you know, FUBU or whatever all the stuff is, you know you know, Netflix, a Apple TV. I mean, um, I would, I would think they were, you know, if, if, if I was starting in the film business, I, I think it would, it would be, um, I know you guys can tell me better, but it, it seems like it would be, a, um, you know, encouraging. Yeah. It, it's definitely more encouraging than it was many years ago. I think a lot of that's just due to like the shift to digital filmmaking and digital cameras. You know, if, if, if people were still making like, if there were no digital cameras and it was like celluloid film, I, I don't know how to do that. Right. Like there's no way, like I'd be a filmmaker right now. And, and I think that while, like you said, there's a lot of different avenues, there's streaming, there's direct to consumer, there's, you know, um, other forms of distribution, there's aggregators that you can go through with filmmaking the big disadvantage is it's now worldwide everywhere and everyone has the same access to the same software. And so it's suddenly a, and, and the same thing goes with music as well. You know, it's, it's suddenly a, oh, you know, if you don't live on in this particular part of the world, you can't do it. Now it's anyone and everyone who can study it can do it. And like that's, and, but that's also the fun challenge of being indie is like, you know, I now have the whole world, like who knows See, how to do, do this. And now I can go and try to see where I stand. Yeah. Right. right yeah yeah so um uh to wrap it up um a question that i always ask people whenever i interview them when, you know whatever particular project they're promoting is um it's something that i always try to ask myself whenever i make something and that is this question if i were to show somebody for the first time one of your records you know i sit them down i'm like we're gonna listen we are going to binge listen to john d nicola today and that is what we're doing cancel all your plans and for the first time, someone's going to hear something that you've done, one of your records. What is the one thing you wish that person would take away from it? Mm. See what I mean about good questions. Um, that uh, they were moved and that they felt it was genuine. You know, that, that they would want to listen to it again. And... Uh, you know, uh, just a, uh, on a gut gut level that, that they connect with it. There are no words to describe uh, how much it means that you decided to come on to our show. Thank you so much again. And it was a real pleasure speaking with you. Well, thanks for having me. I, I really appreciate it. Uh, and as I said, I, I loved your curveball questions. Yes. Thank you so much again. I hope you have a wonderful night, sir. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm.